So we've just done a video on feedback and feed through and we had this board layout helping to explain the difference. In the last video we had a Google Doc as the kind of artifact, a user interface and a user times multiple people. So let's quickly connect that to Twitter because we're going to talk about Twitter and Facebook. For Twitter, the artifact in the middle is a kind of tweet. This is something that the people produce and then people look at it through different user interfaces, their phone or the browser or whatever to interact with it. Um, and in Facebook, uh, let's, let's say that the main artifact in Facebook is a social media post, which might be a video or a picture or a message. So let's get this out of the way now without losing all the uh, deliciousness. <laughs> Um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about an example study we did. Uh, it was a few years ago now, and it was a collaboration between me and a friend in Germany and his student who came to visit, and we worked here for a while. And we were interested in why people used the favorite button, as it was at the time on Twitter. There's a little heart button, which I think they call the like button, but it used to be a star, and it was a favorite button. So we did a pretty large survey. We had 606 people and filled out a survey, and there were multiple aspects to that survey, but the key detail for this discussion is that we uh, ask people to, in general, say, why do you favorite a tweet or like a tweet, favorite a tweet? Um, and then we said, so thank you for that, that example. Uh, can you show us the last one you favorited and explain why you favorite that one? And the reason we do both of those things is because if you get people to talk uh, hypothetically about situations, you end up with pathetic data hypothetic data. Um, and then if you uh, ask people to talk about an actual example of something they've done, you get more factual data is what I tend to say. So we had these examples of, of why people had favorited all these tweets. Uh, lots of examples, and this was quite interesting. And then we coded up all the examples uh, and produced a taxonomy of 25 reasons, which got picked up by BuzzFeed. And they called it why we favorite tweets according to science. There were quite a few comments backwards saying it's not exactly science, but uh, it's a survey study we did. And it was interesting and helped us to examine the design of a particular feature, one aspect, and how it does feed through and feedback and everything like that. In that regard, we can talk about why did they change it to a heart in, I think it was early to, no, when was it? At some point, they changed it to a heart. I did have it logged on my computer somewhere. But at the time, they argued that it was because it was a more universally recognized icon for showing that you liked things. And actually, we can see that the function of a bookmark star, which is where we see the star most commonly used, uh, is mostly assigned to just kind of collecting things or, you know, it being a kind of thing you want to come back to, which was only one portion of all the reasons we saw people using the favorite button. Uh, whereas a heart slash like represents the majority of the cases we were, we were talking about, uh, that they liked it or they found it useful information or emotionally stimulating or worth, worth a kind of like to it. Um, or to say that they approved of it and things like that. This is more aligned with uh, nonverbal communications to say that something was good or approved or that you like it, essentially. And so the icon matched more the multiple use cases. This, the next question you could ask then is, well, if we have so many use cases for this like button or this favorite button, whatever it is at that point, should it be more than one button? And here we're talking about the complexity of the user interface versus the likelihood that people want to say different things uh, versus the amount of space you have to let them do those things. You're forcing the user to think until it becomes intuitive what they're saying by clicking on this button. So if you add options, you add choice and therefore you add think and then you add barriers to them doing it. So you want to make sure the technology is designed so it's super easy to do those things if you want them to do it. If you make it possible to do it, but super complex to do it, then you're increasing the barrier to actually doing it and the motivation, you lose the motivation to do it and people don't do it. Um, so they could, for example, have a kind of save button next to tweets, which would fulfill the separate functionality of keeping things for use for later and have those go into a certain space uh, where you find those. Because, and then have a separate one, which is just you communicating, you don't want to see that tweet again necessarily, but you said you liked it and that was allowed you to do that. So yeah, if you had these two separate functions, that might uh, make it clearer why you have the buttons and use them separately and give you more power and more functionality without adding too much. But if you start having 25 different buttons in there, uh, you're challenging the uh, tolerance that people have for using your software. As user interface designers or software builders, it's our choice, it's our decision then to try and support the things that people are trying to do with your software as best as possible. And a lot of user interface design is trying to first establish all of those ways that people might use software 
and then uh, monitoring how people use your software then helps you to refine and improve things over time, which is why we see social networks changing on a quite a regular basis to allow people to do things they are trying to do and then are finding hacks to do. So you could say that the way they're using the favorite button was kind of a hack of its main functionality, especially with the competitions. This is people reusing the function for something else. And maybe that's why we, you know, we start to see specific polls being built into Twitter, because uh, now you can actually give people options and have them click on it and then show the results, because it's giving people the functionality that they want to do with their community without them having to reuse and confuse the use of a particular function they've already built in. You used to have your list of favorite tweets, and now it's your list of uh, liked tweets, and you still have access to that, um, but it's got in there all the things you've sort of told someone you liked or you, you non-verbally communicated and you don't necessarily want to keep those long term. I don't, I don't know. Um, I can imagine this is a way from this particular one feature that that software might still evolve over time. But that one feature is in lots of different uh, bits of software, lots of different social networks. So in Instagram, we see the same heart button next to everything. And what, the way they show you, the way they feed through information about what other people have done about your artifact tweet, uh, Instagram pictures is you see this kind of a, uh, an icon which is number of hearts and then another one which is number of uh, comments on it. And so uh, you kind of get a metadata view as you hover over each, uh, each picture that you've put out. And that, that seems to permeate all sorts of collaborative things. You know, YouTube uh, has that, how many comments you've got, how many likes, how many dislikes, Facebook. Instagram, etc., etc. So it's interesting you mentioned YouTube because YouTube's got a thumbs up and a thumbs down, and then you start to see kind of people getting quite uh, upset. Or what does it mean that you've had you know so many thumbs downs? Is it the technical quality of the video? Is yeah. It, is it the editorial content? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. in the next video, we're going to talk briefly about uh, the social phenomenon that those different functions create, because there was also this desire. Lots of people wanted to have a dislike button on Facebook. And they're always saying they, you know, we want to have this, we want to have this, but it ne never really existed. Um, and that's because the button was originally there to approve of what was posted. Uh, or, and so, if you get approval, then that's good because you put you put something out that you think people will like to see, and then you get a count of whether people like it. Um, but there are obviously lots of examples where people post things that they think other people would like to see because it's a bad situation. They want other people. Other, they think other people would want to know that that's happened. So, so they'd perhaps, be aware. yeah, somebody they know, you know, is ill or something like that. So, yeah. So they're spreading the news, but then then there's this quandary as to well, how do we how do we notify those people that we've seen that without saying like because we don't like the is that, yeah. Is that what we're saying? You'd see lots of examples of people liking it and then saying I pressed like because I want <laughs> I want you to know My that thoughts are with you yeah right? that I've seen it and that uh, I I know that you're ill or something like that. You know, they want, they want to show approval non-verbally, but without, and then they have to back up with verbal. And then they verbal. have to do the verbal to it, yeah. So. Yeah, so, so Facebook in early 2016 did uh, have this fuller range of uh, responses that they could use uh, so that you could express upset, but without directly saying that you think something is bad, like you think a post is a bad post. You could express a fuller range of emotions. Uh, and what they would have done is worked quite carefully on how easy it was to do that because obviously you're adding complexity to the process and I guess a lot of people do just probably still press like without engaging with the more deeper uh, ways of expressing their emotion to it. I think there's possibly uh, cultural differences as well because I mean in Britain we're not likely to throw some tears at something necessarily just because you know whereas I think that is interesting. in other cultures that the people are more direct sometimes but that's maybe me being a bit I don't know, stereotyping us Brits. Yeah, well, I think you're right in terms of the difference um, between some cultures, but it's interesting to know whether or not there's a, a difference in use or a quantifiable difference in use for the icons. So, yeah, so it's interesting to think why have they got these extra features? How do they design it to make that easy for people to use without it being a cost barrier? And the way they did that is by having the button there for you to press if you want to. But then if you hover and interact, you can be more expressive if you wanted to be more expressive. Um, and it's now easier, There's, technology is better such that it's easier to do that and so the barrier of doing it is less so it's now easier to build it into your social network without 
ruining the use of it. This is the technology barriers being reduced to so the technology readiness, which was back from our first video, uh, to make the motivations of people wanting to do it easier so there's a less of a hurdle to jump over. And it'll be interesting to see if we see these types of more expressive communications, non-verbal communications, come into other platforms as it becomes easier. And so what we're going to do on the next video is start to talk about why systems are designed certain ways. Uh, if you change how it's designed, what behaviours it encourages or, uh, or discourages. And then how those uh, different bits of software relate back to the theories we had originally. Uh, and see what behaviours they encourage on social networks or social software systems. So sometimes your floppies would die, so you often would make backup copies. Um, let's try this one. Sounds more hopeful. And so there was this game called Lander, 